fine. How are you? Hi, <laughs> everyone. Hey, Good morning. My name is Zachary Michael Buzzy. I'm the Arts Administration Coordinator here at Actors Theatre of Louisville. Um, I'd like to welcome you again to the 39th Annual Humana Festival of the American Plays here. Um, we've got a really incredible panel for you this morning. Um, I'd also like to welcome everyone who's live streaming on HowlRound TV right now. Um, today's panel is presented in part by the Louisville Arts and Cultural Association's Yes Fest, which is the Year of Environment and Sustainability, uh, a year-long festival that connects Louisville's arts and cultural um, organizations to consider our impact on the environment and also how we can foster a healthier world. Um, our panel discussion this morning was born out of uh, an increased focus in recent years on interdisciplinary <coughs> research and learning between various forms of uh, sciences and arts around the country, especially at institutions of higher learning. Um, we're really excited about the group that we have here today, both artists and scientists. Uh, their specialties range from performance art uh, to physics, climate science, uh, environment, or, excuse me, information visualization and music. Uh, and together, they're working to challenge the conventional boundaries uh, of their craft and also uh, help answer some of today's most quest or pressing environmental questions. Um, like, how do artists and scientists' unique strengths benefit discovery? How do we measure interdisciplinary success uh, in any particular work? And how might some of these successes help to uh, change policy uh, on global climate change? Uh, so with us today, from left to right, we have Steve Cawson, who's also our moderator. Uh, he's the artistic director of The Civilians, which is a uh, New York-based theater company, creating original work derived from it, investigating um, the world around us and beyond theater. We have Joe Walker, who's a playwright and a theater maker living in Minneapolis, who recently participated in a program called The Arctic Circle. Uh, and that's an international artist residency abroad on an ice class sailing vessel uh, in the high Arctic. <coughs> we have Jessica Segal, um, a multidisciplinary artist living in New York City and investigating the link between creativity and survival. Evo Peters, who's an experimental physicist working at the University of Chicago, where he's investigating the dynamic behavior of granular suspensions. And uh, Cynthia Hopkins, who's an internationally acclaimed musical performance artist. And finally, we have Ruth West, who's an artist, scientist, and director of the X-Res Arts and Science Lab at the University of North Texas. Uh, each of our panelists is going to take a few minutes um, to share one of their interdisciplinary projects with you, uh, just to provide a little bit of context of what these collaborations can look like. Uh, then we'll have some time for our panel discussion, and then in the last 10 or 15 minutes, uh, we will take your questions. So please join me in welcoming Steve and the rest of our panel today. Thanks. Um, thank you all for uh, getting up this morning, coming out. Um, so we're just going to start off, each of us is going to speak uh, very briefly uh, about our projects, but then as we have our discussion, I think we'll each get into the, into the details of, of what we did and each of our collaborations. And uh, I'm going first. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a project with the civilians. Uh, it's a play called The Great Immensity um, that was the writer, director, uh, collaborating with uh, Michael Friedman, who was the composer. Uh, the, the play was about uh, climate change, uh, and it was, it was created through um, not necessarily a, a uh, artist-science direct collaboration, but I made the play from a lot of conversations with scientists, and, and in, in that sense it was very collaborative. Uh, the, the work of the play started uh, with a, a trip to an, an island in the Panama Canal, uh, which is called Barro, Colorado Island, which is essentially a, a, a reserve of uh, tropical rainforest the only people there are scientists, and and not that it really had anything directly to do with, with climate change. And these are um, pictures from the production of the Dolby Theater uh, in New York. Uh, but and I had no clue as to what to do or what the show was going to be or how to make it. 
Um, so I figured if I was trapped on an island with other scientists and they were trapped with me, uh, that I could hang out and watch what they do and, and then ask them all these sorts of questions that I wanted to ask them, which were things like, you know, how do you go on? How do you um, uh, wake up in the morning? Uh, how do you live in the world knowing everything that you do about what's happening to the world? Um, you know, do you, uh, do you believe in God? Um, do you think there's something that's protecting the planet? Um, stuff like that. Uh, and it was revelatory. I mean, every conversation, you know, went on for, you know, would start off over lunch and go for four hours. And that really laid the foundation for the play. Uh, so the rest of it very briefly, uh, then went to the uh, town in, in um, Churchill, Churchill, Canada, in Canada, uh, which is the polar bear capital of the world. Did more interviews there. There's um, Arctic scientists uh, in Churchill. I did more interviews with, and then we did, um, we were fellows at Princeton and the Princeton Environmental Institute and got access to all of the Princeton scientists to ask whatever I wanted to ask them, and they'd read my draft and give me notes, but often plot notes, <laughs> character notes. Um, <laughs> and some of it good, some of it good. <laughs> I was like, I have a Nobel Prize winner as my prompter. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then there's also a climate model in Princeton, so we had access, we had the, all of the scientists of the climate model for an afternoon to, to talk to them, uh, and then made a play. And the show was funded by the National Science Foundation, so there was, which was the first time that they funded a play on that scale. Uh, so that's the great messy, and on to Joe. Hi. Um, so my uh, approach to this is um, started when I was a kid, and um, I would, I've always been attracted to uh, really cold, remote places. And I used to make travel brochures with uh, crayons and colored pencils to <laughs> get my parents to take us on um, vacations to cold, remote places, which we never went to. Um, so a lot of the work when I started writing uh, became a way for me to imagine going to those places. Um, so some of the images that you'll see are uh, from different projects that I've done. Um, I have uh, imagined trips to Antarctica um, uh, as traditional plays. Um, I have uh, worked with uh, some scientists and coders when I was in graduate school at Brown um, to create a virtual reality environment of Antarctica as I imagine it, um, creating like out of uh, its visuals composed entirely of text that are um, imagined log journals of the trip that I've never taken. Um, and uh, also kind of childhood drawings. Um, and then, while I was also at Brown, I got, I got a grant to go to Iceland to work on a project that has kind of been um, several years in the making, um, that was really mostly about folklore and Norse mythology. And um, I was really interested in how Iceland was um, trying to explain its landscape um, in literature, and that uh, folklore and mythology in Iceland was a way of um, teaching children lessons, but also a way of explaining the weird boulder that was in the middle of the field from a troll battle, or this incredible waterfall, and there's thousands of waterfalls in Iceland, there's, it's insane. And, um, but those were the tears of giants, and I thought that, that, was, that really spoke to me. Um, and I would always wanted to go to the Arctic Circle, so uh, there's a program called the Arctic Circle um, that uh, Zach mentioned in my bio. Um, that's uh, where they take 30 uh, people, on, in my instance, that was a mix of artists and scientists, uh, aboard a sailing vessel for three weeks. And um, it's project driven, so whatever you want to work on. And I thought that I was going to go and create a, um, I was going to write this mythology for Svalbard, whatever that was. Um, and I, I got there, and there's no stories to mine from. There's no stories of giants or uh, trolls or hidden people. There's um, science got there first, so no one, there was no need to try and explain <coughs> the landscape. Um, but that was even more interesting to me that there's this mythology of scientists, and that there's 
you you sit at a bar and um, in any one of the very few towns, and you're usually sitting next to scientists and glaciologists and um, and fishermen um, and some tourists. But it's just it's so much is happening here in terms of science and the global seed bank being located there, and there's this incredible <coughs> machine that changes the ionosphere that's crazy and awesome. Um, so that's the project that I'm working on now. Um, I didn't get to do a lot of the research there. I kind of figured it out while I was there. Um, but I did some shots, I think, um, from a, a short film that I made while I was there. It was inspired by an Italian explorer and the Pope, um, and kind of imagining a conversation that they would have in trying to Across the North Pole, and uh, um, and the battle that they had between science and faith, and doing so. Great. Hello, uh, I'm Jessica, and I have a short video clip that maybe I could just show uh, before I speak about the topic. Um, 
And just a little background, um, I got involved in this project through uh, Ido Aharoni, who is the composer of this piece, um, who had seen previous work I had done on issues of food security and climate change in the Arctic. Um, I was also a participant in the Arctic Circle Residency, uh, in particular to see the global sea faults there, and had done projects in the past with um, uh, a group called the Maz, which advocates for indigenous uh, women in Mexico to retain rights, uh, for basically sea rights, in order to you know, uh, maintain a localized economy and legacy in agriculture. So uh, again, I work with sculpture and video, but um, generally around issues of adaptation to extreme climates, changing agriculture, and sort of, uh, I guess just one more note on this piece before I move on to Evo is that uh, those are cast ice sculptures that were brought into the laboratory at the University of Chicago, where uh, Evo was already working on uh, basically going into the laboratory where there was equipment that was already filming with a high-speed camera um, uh, fracturing of materials, uh, which was so beautiful when I first saw it, I didn't know how I could possibly uh, like enhance it as an artist. Like maybe the raw material was already fine, uh, but it, uh, again, it felt like as an artist that what I work with often is symbols instead of language and data and mythology instead of possibly uh, trying to create a documentary narrative. Um, so uh, I ended up casting the ice sculptures and seeing what would happen to them uh, being crushed inside this laboratory and filmed in slow motion. Um, sort of as a metaphor for those that are not directly involved, or uh, living in a space uh, in central uh, United States and sort of a suburban economy aren't being immediately impacted by climate change versus those that are on the fringes. Um, okay. <laughs> so, my name is Ivo. Um, so, Jess already did all the hard work of introducing uh, the background of this uh, project. So, I want to add one, one more small thing to this. And um, so, oh, so, here are some pictures. Yeah. So, this is uh, in, in the laboratory. And so you see a, a so maybe you don't, but there's a big machine there in the background. And so when when I talked with Pio Aroni, who initiated this project, um, so he wanted to do something climate change, uh, disappearing ice. So I thought, uh, okay, maybe we can just uh, destroy ice. Um, <laughs> so so and, and in the laboratory we have actually the equipment to do this because uh, it may sound kind of easy a piece of ice and you break it. But uh, so I dare every one of you to go home, take a piece of ice cube out of your fridge and try to break it with your hands. It's it's really, really hard. So <laughs> so this is why I have uh, equipment to do this. Uh, if something that shows this. Uh, no so um, so we have we have a, a material tester machine in our lab. So this is just a big machine which you can use to break anything that you want. Uh, so it can, <laughs> and, and pull on it. And so to, to break one of these uh, ice sculptures that you just saw in this movie, um, you have to use the force of a medium-sized car on this to actually uh, make a break. So. You can try, but it's really hard. So another way <laughs> to break it is to uh, simply throw a piece of ice on the ground. And uh, so this is what you see here. Uh, so this is kind of the setup with uh, a nice or sorry, this piece of ice on the ground. And maybe uh, so I was actually hoping that there was some movies in here because then I can much better explain what's going on. Um, but so, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so, so one of the movies that you just showed when, when Jess was talking, so there's this, uh, this ice sculpture of this house, uh, which was falling down, and then uh, it's the ground and it breaks. Uh, so the, the way that we make this ice sculpture, so you just have this mold, you put it in the fridge, 
And uh, so this takes a very long time actually to, to freeze such a big piece of ice. So, and, and this was with us for, uh, for a weekend. And um, so we had this thing in the fridge, we were waiting all day, and by the end of the day, it finally was frozen enough that we could actually uh, shoot this shot. And um, as you can see, once you do this shot, the house is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, so this is our setup, right? We have this very small area where we have to drop this house. And to give you an idea how these high-speed cameras work, um, so if you blink your eye like this, uh, that's that's about the amount of time uh, in which everything that you just saw in one of these movies happens. This really happens like this. And so this, this camera takes uh, several thousand images per second, so that's why you can actually see what's going on once uh, something like that breaks. Um, but this is also a lot of pressure when you're actually doing this experiment, because you have to uh, trigger this camera right at the right moment. So that you actually capture these things which happens in the blink of an eye. And so I, I was standing there, so I had this, this piece of ice in my hands. We had this camera set up there, and someone else was sitting there with his finger on the trigger. And th this was really intense because I had to go at the right, the exact right place, of course, because if I dropped a little bit to the side, you don't see anything at all. And, <laughs> And it has to be triggered right at the right moment. So, but this turned out uh, really well, actually. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, after we had a couple more times, we could just throw things on the ground and get more footage for this. But, um, yeah, so this is a bit, uh, I guess, my kind of my side of this uh, story how we uh, made this project. And I also thought you had some specialized equipment that could freeze something immediately. <laughs> Which doesn't exist, by the way. So it really was waiting for uh, 24 hours for each mold to be ready. <laughs> visceral 
and more entertaining and therefore more um, able to be absorbed uh, than communication coming from journalism or science, uh, the science world. And so those two speeches together made me want to make something about this issue. And then um, I happened to mention that to somebody at the conference who a couple months later started working for an organization called Cape Farewell, which has basically the same mission as Tipping Point. They want to foster dialogue about the climate crisis by bringing artists and scientists together, but they do it by launching, uh, mostly launching voyages in the Arctic. So I, I did a similar thing to these other guys where I went uh, on, and lived on a little boat, a sailboat in the Arctic for a few weeks. Um, and with a bunch of other uh, artists and scientists. And so what I ended up making um, was inspired mostly by that trip, that voyage. And so it was, it was kind of like a live documentary musical storytelling about that trip and me learning about what's happening, um, the very like tiny perspective of my life, and then drawing connections to my tiny life. Um, and my perspective is that of an alcoholic in recovery, and so I sort of drew connections between um, the society being addicted to fuels that are destroying our habitat, but we can't let them go. It's not so easy to let them go. And, um, and then I also drew parallels between the boat and the Earth, um, like both Mr. Fuller did, you know, Spaceship Earth. Because it became very palpable being on a little tiny boat, but there's a limited amount of water, and that if you make trash, it's going to be on the boat with you. Uh, and that's harder to, you know, feel when you're on the Earth. Um, and we also found trash, human trash, in the middle of this landscape where there's obviously no human civilization. So, so basically, my piece just tells the story of that trip. And, and then it's interspersed by commentaries from wildly fictional characters who are from a ghost from 200 years in the past and a Native American woman who was killed um, during the westward expansion and then uh, a character from outer space, so from very far away, who has a wider perspective on Earth because he's from another planet, uh, and then a character from the future who's two, from 200 years in the future who's who's coming back to let us know that it really turns out OK. Like, our civilization is going to be just, we're going to destroy our civilization, but that's actually a good thing. <laughs> I mean, that's, her, that's just her perspective. I'm not saying that that's true. Or anything. <laughs> um, so that's the piece that I made. Hi, I'm Ruth West. Scientist, and I have the X-ray art science lab at the University of North Texas. So how I got here is uh, I had a day job, which is the image on the left, and uh, so that's the, uh, the figure from the first scientific publication that I was ever part of, the uh, National Academy of Sciences. And on the right are details from these really large-scale uh, abstract expressionist paintings that I used to make. So I live in an artist studio. Do that at night. Go to the life bio lab in the morning. About <laughs> 10 years or so ago, uh, I started asking this question. So maybe there's something in between. If there's an art science, what does it look like? How do you do it? Uh, and most importantly, what do you get from doing that that you can't get otherwise? And, uh, and then subsequently, you know, can the arts actually nurture scientific discovery? So I've kind of been walking this path, uh, taking this on. And I'm currently at the University of North Texas. I found a laboratory, and our goal is to develop new ways of seeing and ways of knowing, because that's what I believe this blending can give us. And our mission and vision is to come up with breakthroughs in areas that require people to come together across disciplines, something that you can't do on your own. And the things that we produce range from everything from new types of art, or new technologies, new knowledge, and in particular, new kinds of education and new academic industry community partnerships. So um, that's a shot of our lab, kind of like the daily chaos. There's currently 14 students, uh, about 50-50 split between grads and undergrads, and listed there are all the different fields we currently have, working together journalism, anthropology, psychology, music, you can see them listed, uh, media, photography, computer science, GIS, information systems, sculpture, uh, you know, just 
it's an amazing blend of people coming together, they're working on different projects and together and learning from each other. Um, so I'm going to show you one short 30 second video and then uh, another longer video with kind of uh, different uh, kind of ends of the spectrum of the kind of things we do. Um, I'll try one more time. I just played one more time. All right, so this is uh, called Project of Photo Brief Introductions. It's a collaboration between colleagues at four different universities. Um, uh, I'm currently at UNT, uh, Washington University, St. Louis, the University of Vermont. We've all had uh, faculty and students working on this for about four years. Are you sick of trying to line up new pictures with old photos? <laughs> Tired of fighting with bulky camera equipment? <laughs> Repeat photography doesn't have to be this hard. Refoto, available for Android and iOS devices, allows you to quickly and easily line up new photos with old. You can either select from ongoing nearby citizen science projects or even create your own. Refoto is great for environmental monitoring, tracking urban development projects, or even keeping tabs on your most recent home improvement projects. <laughs> Start making your repeat photography projects easy today by going to the iOS or Google Play stores and downloading Refoto for free. For more information, visit projectrefoto.com. So that was part of a larger uh, sort of long-term research project to understand the ways in which we as everyday citizens can contribute to scientific projects that require imaging. The images of the environment, but also this is being used worldwide to monitor changes in everything from ice rinks to um, historical uh, cultural heritage sites in Tasmania. And now there's a refoto site right up on the front door of the Actors Theater. So you guys can find it, download it, find it, and then help them see how the trees bloom along the street here. We'll set up a field. You can even add places by in the app, there's an ad location. You can just on the fly add a location, a point of view, the end procedure. You'd like someone to discover. So now the point about the art science integration here, though, is rephotography is an artistic method, and it's being used to capture data you actually can't get otherwise, because you can get satellite imagery and or live imagery of an urban area, but that's expensive and it's at a certain point in time. But here, anybody, any any time can be guided to take a photograph. So the next project, uh, <clears throat> so we talk a lot about the Arctic, this is about the Antarctic. <laughs> so I'm just telling you this, it's called the instrument for one Antarctic night. And Antarctic night takes four months, and um, well, then we go to the rest. Telescopes, 
and we're opening up the black box of science and allowing us to experience it through something that's very relevant today, which is remix culture. We're all used to this concept, you know, we copy and paste every day on our word processors, but we don't realize that when you're working with data, it's, it's kind of like a fluid that goes from one state of water, can go from liquid to the solid or gaseous state. And so um, we're actually in the process of developing this piece. So just give it to the Thank you. Great, great, thanks. Um, so uh, we we have um, about like thirteen minutes to have. Uh, <laughs> we'll actually we'll, we'll leave like ten minutes for, for questions from from all of you. So um, I just wanted to throw in a few questions to the, to the panel. Uh, first one being, in your interdisciplinary work or your collaborative work, uh, what what did you learn from the other the other sides? And, and, uh, and Specifically, it's just in terms of process. If you were an artist, was there something in the way that you experienced science working where you then thought, aha, I want that, or I want that to be part of my, my work somehow? <laughs> what did you get from the other? Um, I'll just say I've been on a couple different uh, residency models that do uh, try to blend uh, artists and scientists working together towards a common goal. And I I just got really excited about a couple things working with Evo. One was the access, of course, to the equipment and uh, the expertise, like that sort of. Um, and I also found, I guess there were some similarities that I found that I wasn't expecting, I think. And one was the general excitement that you and Jim expressed over seeing this footage, um, <laughs> which could have been something that was seen many times over. Um, so there was, I guess there was a shared interest in the outcome. And I think I just wanted to bring up something as well with the conversation we had yesterday, where I felt like possibly the artist's methodology is different in terms of finding, not necessarily creating a repeatable experiment, but creating a critical engagement with the topic that doesn't have necessarily a commodifiable outcome, but it's sort of uh, something that's uh, working towards uh, yeah, critically engaging an idea and perhaps just um, yeah, challenging uh, accepted theory, which I thought might be different than the sciences. But uh, you were speaking yesterday, actually, yeah, just cr the critique and uh, Exploration, I guess, in our experience, seemed to be similar, um, and not necessarily just finding so, like a solution base, but the actual experience of making and working uh, seemed to be shared. <coughs> you know what else? Yes. Yeah. So, so maybe what I can ask. So, um, so the things that we did, right? So. Um, I was not really sure because I, I'm a scientist, so what I'm eventually after is to do to create some scientific data out of this. Um, <coughs> but uh, so it's not that I always, uh, whatever I do, I have to get data out of something. So that was something that what happened in this project. So often when I when I do experiments, so I try to explore different directions, and uh, so I basically just do experiments and then I, I look at them, for example, I take videos of things and then I look at them, is there anything interesting, interesting in that? And so this is kind of the way that I approach this problem, which is, so I, I say I think it's a problem. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what scientists do, I guess. Um, so this project, um, so, so it was not that I thought, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to get scientific data out of this. It's just, we're going to make these videos, and uh, I think they're going to be super, super nice. You can make it to high speed cameras, and it's going to look nice. But there's also so many things to see in there, and maybe there's an off chance that there is actually something in there that I haven't seen before yet, and that might be worth investigating further. But I also knew almost everything I do, I can throw away after I do it, because it turns out it's completely useless. Uh, but in this case, so in a scientific point of view, it could be useless, so I'm not, not going to write a paper about this. Um, but you have the advantage that whatever comes out of it, 
it's going to be uh, a very nice piece of art. And it's so uh, something which would have otherwise been useless now is very useful actually. So that was a very nice experience. Um, great, and, and, and maybe just speak from the, the, the art side, since here we are at the Met Festival, um, in the world of theater. Uh, for, for the artists or the artist side of you, in, since you, you are both, you, you combine both our worlds in, in one human life. Uh, um, in, in, this, in these particular interactions between the worlds of art and science, what, what, what have you found that the world of, of art uh, offers? What, what, can, what can the art side do that the science side can't? Or does it be so differently? Were you asking her? I'm asking all of you, so <laughs> you can speak. Um, I just have a brief comment on that, which is that I feel like um, I, I had one interaction. You know, my, my piece was, was inspired by these experiences and interactions with scientists, so it wasn't necessarily a direct collaboration, but I did have a lot of conversations with people. And um, sometimes I received unsolicited feedback, <laughs> which frequently happens in the arts. And uh, <laughs> my experience from all different kinds of people, people qualified and totally unqualified. And uh, anyway, so this guy was a. Um, I, I actually did say, you know, if you have any anything to say, but anyway, he sent me a long email, which surprised me. Um, and it was about the final speech of my piece, which is kind of, I don't know if it was rolling any of the video of me naked in the middle of the snow on, well, when my video was playing, but there's this video of me. Because when I was in the Arctic, it really struck me like we could not survive, I could not survive here. And it's a part of the world. And, and you know, the truth is that for the vast majority of the Earth's existence, right, we could not have survived here. Like that it's really a, a a very tiny moment in this planet's history that we're in that we can survive and it's easy to take for granted because we wake up and we can breathe and we can go outside without too much trouble, maybe put on a coat, you know what I mean? And, and so it's easy to take for granted, but when you're in a place like that that's very inhospitable to us, it's very palpable. And so to highlight that, I, I made this video of, of myself like a naked, like an animal in the wild, right? Um, and, the, and the text is saying, basically, it would be a shame to uh, not address this problem fully and to leave behind, and the phrase I used was a leave behind a barren landscape where we once found paradise. So that's like a poetic phrasing, right? And so I got this, this feedback from the scientist that said, well, actually, <laughs> we're probably not going to go extinct from this particular issue, like our species will probably survive, and you know, like, I'm not actually convinced of that. But maybe from a scientific perspective, in terms of, um, you know, percentages and stuff like that, it's not. But I think it's important to conceive of that possibility, and also just to conceptualize the mortality of our species, because our species actually is going to go extinct someday, even if it's five billion years from now when the sun burns up, right? We're not here forever, and I, I feel like that's an extremely important fact to grasp at this point in human history. And so, for me, I feel like that's what the arts can bring, is a perspective that is not necessarily, it doesn't bear the burden, like this guy bears the burden of proof, right? Like if he's going to write a paper, he has to be able to prove it, and that's why, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. But it's also, I feel like what the arts can offer is to express scientific ideas in a way that, that is free of that burden. I just want to brief comment on that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I thought about these things in a slightly different uh, take in that um, when you engage within this whole notion of what is irreconcilable differences between generally arts and sciences is the notion of validity through needing to be reproducible and validated within a community of opportunities and knowledge you're contributing and building upon. 
Whereas within the arts, the uniqueness of my work as an artist is what gives it its greatest value and contribution to culture. But the practice of the arts is where I think, in the way that there's three things that I see that artists do when they make work. One of them is they record their process within the objects or thought or writing that they make. The process, the evolution is recorded within that sort of providence of the work. That's very much like the way in which scientists record their protocols or their data. But as artists, no matter the kind of work you do, the, you have an expertise in metaphor that is very, very powerful. And that is a huge contribution to the sciences. And then also the expertise in multimodality in terms of evoking the senses through one word, a sound, a posture, or an image. And that evocative potential, releasing that within the scientific context is also very powerful. Um, great. Uh, well, I, I'm going to ask you. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, um, you know, so, so many of these projects in, engage the subject of, of, of climate change, and and, uh, and three of you have. Well, I, I visited the subarctic. So, have you ever visited the Arctic? Okay. So a lot of us have gotten either into the Arctic or, or close to it, but uh, uh, and. You know, in <laughs> two minutes. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if, if anyone who's sort of, uh, had work that's especially you know gone in front of an audience where you've had that interaction between your, your piece and the and the public. Uh, I just wonder if you can, can speak to the what you perceive to be the the potential of the arts to affect change and actually you know engage this. This crisis, this very complex crisis that we are living in presently, will continue to be living in a very dynamic way. Um, and, and maybe if you just want to throw out something that might, you know, spark some of the questions from our from our audience, and also maybe even if there's something when you realize that this is where the the arts doesn't work so well, or when you hit a wall with the the truth, whatever that might be. Well, I, I think that change is very difficult for um, art to incite, but I think that one of the things that it does really well is to in inspire empathy in people and to personalize this information in an aesthetic way so that we're able to process it and kind of uh, change is, is something that might happen, but um, I'm not sure that uh, the piece can necessarily in sight of itself. I think that's a, it's a, I don't know, I think it's a, it's much more personal than that. Um, but I, I think that there's a, something that's kind of, I don't know, interesting about the, I think it's about the asking of the questions and the kind of following this thread of what's interesting. Um, it's a little bit, I don't know, it can be a little bit messy, but um, I think that's what's exciting about it. Uh, I'll throw in one thought on that subject is that I, I guess I do believe that, that, that art can change society. And, and I think sometimes you can see it more clearly when you think of just in the worlds of, of theater, uh, when you think of some of the most significant catalytic plays that have captured the world's imagination and have transformed society. You can see it, you can see it there. And sometimes you don't necessarily see it in your own work because perhaps your own play isn't necessarily uh, hitting in quite the same way as Angels in America. Uh, but I can think something that I found edifying from being in the world of, of science is that science does have this self-awareness that, that, that each scientist is part of a larger field and that the individual scientist might be looking at one piece of a very large and complex puzzle and in many cases, it might be doing something incredibly tedious and boring in order to gather data, in order to tell, to discover something of this one piece. But they know that their work is part of, of this much larger effort. And I think in the arts, because maybe we emphasize our uniqueness or the singularity of vision, that we don't necessarily look at our work or look at the work of other artists with quite the same awareness, but we are, in fact, 
even though we aren't here reviewing us except when it comes to like funding panels, um, <laughs> working the same way, we we are part of the larger a larger whole, and I think taken as a whole that we you know we we are we are contributing to the direction that our civilization goes in. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> maybe from there, we can just take it out to the to the audience if you want. Um, you have to ask any particular questions of of a, of a panelist, and yeah, there's a gentleman in the back. We have microphones, so and, and we need to use the mics so that we are we are captured on our live streaming Power Round TV. Over here, Hi, TV. Good morning, thank you so much for the informing this panel. Within seconds after receiving a text message from my friend Ash in India, I was so happy for him and his family, as Dr. Patchouli, and he was sharing the Nobel Prize with Al Homer for the work they were doing in relation to climate change. And within a few hours, a counter campaign was launched to discredit and show the fallacies of the data that was all funded by the oil industry. And so I asked this question as a way of being able to make an important point. That there are industries in this world that are well funded and do a great deal of harm to be able to counter the work of artists, of scientists, to discredit their work in relation to preserving the interests they have, whether it be the food industry, whether it be the mining industry, whether it be the oil industry. And so what can artists do, and people in this house, because you all have audiences, to be able to counter, to be able to expose, and stay at least 20 years ahead of what they're doing, because they're way ahead of us. Uh, well, I don't know if we can answer the question. I'll just throw in one, we talked about this a little bit before, I'll just throw in one quick thing about my experience, which is it's, it's, it's true, I think there's a, there's a great appetite for the collaboration of the arts and the sciences. Um, as someone who got funded by the government to do a play about climate change, we we ended up getting a lot of uh, heat from mostly from the right wing media, uh, not directly from the fossil fuels industry. But while our show was running at the public, there were probably a hundred right wing um, uh, website and blog and newspaper uh, articles about us. Um, our grants been been up, uh, used used as a as a weapon against the National Science Foundation. Um, our our theater company's websites were, were hacked and taken down, costing us like a thousand dollars, but still thousand dollars to put them back up again. And and my I don't this is someone else could probably answer the question better, but I think I I felt very aware of of how how strong the force can come from the other side and and did not really feel anything of of an equal support in in the world in which in which I live. I guess I we were just talking before about the power of theater and how uh, you know when we're when you're doing a work of art, you're doing a, a play, it's not necessarily considered important enough to be taken up by the national media. Um, it's not hitting a large enough audience. It's not, a, it's not a film, it's not a TV, it's not significant enough. Um, but then, at least in, in my experience, like Fox News was felt it significant enough to, to criticize it in a pretty public way. Uh, and, and we are, I guess what I want to say from all that is that I guess what are the messages that I think that, that for the most part those of us in the humanities, those of us who aren't connected to these issues maybe in a direct real way, I think are very much just living in a, in a, in a bubble and living in a, a world and, um, that, is, that, is not, that is not real, that is not actually what is, what is, what is at stake and what's, it, what, what's happening in the world. Um, if, someone, if someone else wants me to address the, the question of I what just, have our key twenty years ahead of the game? I just want to give a shout out. I just want to give a shout out. <laughs> just, just to the power 
power of communication and the freedom of speech to um, you know, fight the powers that be. I think that's a, it's a really true thing. And it, it can be daunting. It can be daunting what you're saying, what you're talking about, you know. Um, but like there's a documentary called Gasland about uh, fracking, about the impact of fracking on, on uh, and you know, people lighting their uh, tap water on fire and, you know. And, and that's, you know, that, that can empower people to not sell their land to the oil companies who come and buy it to frack on it. And so I just think, I think that's the power. I mean, yes, these organizations are, they have the money in there, and that's power, and they're, you know, as you say, probably 20 years ahead. Um, but then there's also, you know, I think the power of the arts and the humanities is, is the power of, of communication and knowledge. And, and, and that's, you know, just the choice to speak about a certain issue in a public forum is a form of power, I think. You know what I mean? Um, like, in other words, an audience who comes to see that piece, whatever it is, Gasland, or one of these shows, might then have in their consciousness a little bit more uh, about this issue, and then might, you know, read the the responses to what you're talking about in a different way. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it all comes down to inspiration. So you can have knowledge, but if you're not inspired, then nothing happens. And so what I love about theater is that it inspires people. So anyway, hats off to all of you to get to do this stuff. <laughs> That's great. I, I just want to just throw in one, one other quick thought, which I do think is an important distinction to, to talk very briefly just about the, maybe the difference between between art and and media. Uh, because I think, yes, like, like Gaslang is a really effective documentary film and reaches a, lot, a wide audience, but but as a, as a and is, is artistic, but is has can have a direct impact and works differently, I think, than, than work that might engage the ways of knowing or might be about metaphor, which is maybe probably not going to have the same sort of direct real-world issue-connected outcome. Um, that there, there are ways in which art works on, as, as you said, the, the ways of knowing, the ways of thinking. Right, but and culture is, uh, sorry, it's just that culture is much broader than any singular issue. You know, if we boil it down to just life or death issues, then we're missing the fact that the fact that everyone here has voice, not just those that might believe the same, right? And I think it's awesome that Fox News was even interested in your play.
coverage from that moment, but I, I think that everyone on this, on this panel is, is generally en enthusiastic about all feedback. There's moments when you're an artist where you're like, just just like done a show and someone comes up and says something like, why did you want it to be so boring? That you know, <laughs> like, I feel like we need to learn how to talk to each other again here. But, um, outside of that, I think that, that you know, I think all, all, all this work is, is, a, is about starting those conversations and that the, and that the contributions of every citizen are very are critical, really. Oh, I'll just I'll just say to to counter my previous comment, I'll, I'll just say that um, I I actually am really happy that that we live in an age where there is a a, um, a stage, a panel, a stadium, a podium, a forum for all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, which is the World Wide Web, you know, and that, and I've found responses to my work from audience members to be much more interesting and informed and, and astute than uh, the critics who are qualified to comment on it. So yeah, I do welcome feedback and that's sort of the whole point of, of um, at least what I do, you know, is to encourage um, conversation and thought to go beyond the scope of the, of the theater. Okay. I just also wanted to say that um, Part of the reason to choose to be an artist is that uh, causing problems is part of your job. Right? <laughs> you, call it, you know, you, you can uh, critique, you can uh, causing controversy does show sometimes that you are 20 years ahead of thinking and does working with problematizing issues, discussing things that uh, maybe can't be talked about in the mainstream media because there are too many. Uh, funding issues, and, and when it does become a real issue, it often is when it does come down to finances, when a national grant does fund something that's not accepted yet, or um, by uh, other like, general conventions at the time, um, which is interesting, when the money can sometimes be the talking point of, of what is our value, uh, what are our values, and, but um, I, I do think it's, uh, that's an important part of our job, is to create problems, to cri criticize ideas, to um, connect ideas that may not be uh, considered uh, connectable in that way, and that's where cross-collaboration uh, uh, is important. But yeah, I, I do think that yeah, creating uh, feedback that we don't normally, uh, maybe isn't good feedback, is also part of our job as well. Do you want, do you, I think Ruth should just squeeze in one last thought because we're over time. So you so get one last quick I, thought. I think this is both a very valuable intersection, but it's also very fragile. Um, and I think that one of the more important things about it is to just to sustain it and to keep it alive rather than to polarize it with any particular issue. Because, you know, if you think back to human history and the way that we create culture and knowledge, there wasn't a divergence between the arts and the sciences. There was kind of a holistic activity. And now people interested in this intersection, they're starting to build skill sets that are very desirable. And it's those people with those skill sets that will come up with solutions that will create things we don't know about. So I think part of why I'm grateful to be here and have met this group of people and all of you is that there is, this is a launching point. It's not the end, you know? It's a beginning place um, for things that happen. That was like a perfect thing. <laughs>